Hello everyone and welcome to Jojolian chapter 88 review and discussion. And as you guys can probably tell already, we're in a new space. And at the end of last month's Jojolian review, I said that um, when I move into the new place and when I set up for the Jojolian reviews, I wanted this to be like the nicest it's looked yet. And it's crazy to think about since I started reviewing Jojolian back in 2016, we've had four different areas we've done reviews and I've lived in three different places, which is kind of crazy. So. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. It's sort of, you know, my two favorite things in the world, Kingdom Hearts and JoJo. Uh, I finally hung up the 100,000 subscriber plaque. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to reach that. And we're already so close to 200K, which is exciting. It only took me almost 100,000 subscribers to actually hang this thing up on the wall. But we have that next to the Kingdom key, some art behind me. And then you have Jojo A Go Go, Jojonium Volumes, Kingdom Hearts 3 Deluxe Edition with um, Jojo 6251. And then underneath that, there's some other cool stuff. Uh, stay tuned to the end of the video. I might give you guys like a, a whole tour of this shelf because down at the bottom, there's some like other cool collectibles too. But uh, to get into Jojolian chapter 88, really exciting chapter this month uh, because it's all about Jobin, one of like the fan favorite characters of Jojolian. And it's nice to see more Jobin because when we were introduced to Mama Zuku, when we were fighting, you know, a lot of the rock I almost said rock human or rock animals. We we're fighting a mix of rock humans or rock animals. Like we didn't really see Jobin at all. And like everyone loved Jobin when he was first introduced. And then we got a little bit of action during the ozone baby fight with Jobin. And like this entire arc right now, or I guess it's like a mini arc sort of is dedicated to Jobin. And it actually concludes this chapter. So um, I have a lot of great things to say about, you know, the way Araki went about reintroducing Ojiro into the story and what he was used for. Because like when I finished reading this chapter, and like this whole Ojiro return to Dark, I was like, okay, what was like, what was the point of this? What was the point of bringing Ojiro back if he's gone in just two chapters? But, um, you know, after some discussion and thinking, uh, I think there's some actual really good reasons why Rocky decided to bring Ojiro back. But we'll get into that later uh, towards the end. So to get into the actual chapter this month, hold on, let me... <laughs> oh my God, it's kind of a scuffed setup I have right now. I have uh, my keyboards hanging up over here on a cat tree and I'm like pretty far away from my monitor, but it'll work. In the future, I want to get like a little clicker so I can just like click through the chapter as I go through it instead of having my keyboard over here. Um, but to start off, let's start off with the cover of Ultra Jump this month. Really awesome cover. We have the soft and wet tree. So it's Josuke with a tree. And I like the way that Araki drew like the little like flowers or plants. If you guys like go back and reread JoJoLine from the beginning, these trees with these circular little spiky, I don't even know, flowers on them. Araki has drawn so much in Jojolian. Even like it's it's probably the most consistent thing in the entire part. This specific tree. People have made like theories around this tree, what it can mean, and they they use them as landmarks to sort of like pick around where areas are. Like people use those trees to be like, okay, so outside the Higashi got a home, you know, it's right where we saw the flashback with Joseph Umi and Kira. So these trees, for whatever reason, Araki really likes drawing them or they're really important in some way. And you know, you have soft and wet on it with like a bunch of motifs to Jojo. You have an SBR sticker, the Morio Town logo, the Osin shop, just all the things we know and love from Jojo. And uh, yeah, it's just really nice looking. And Josuke is also in the same pose that we'll see in the cover page. And some other stuff on this with the Jojo anime coming to its finale. Uh, I think less than, or like, once once we reach tomorrow, I think this video is going to be uploaded on Sunday, so it'll be exactly a week until the uh, the Golden Wind finale, guys. It's been a hell of a run, and I have some exciting videos coming out to like celebrate the ending of Golden Wind, but you guys will see that on um, the day that the finale comes out. Um, so to get on to Jojolian 88 this month, uh, we have the cover page, which is Josuke, just, just straight up Josuke, no background, and this is a uh, Elvis Presley pose that Josuke is doing, uh, people, like, I recognized this pose when I saw it, but then later on Twitter after the chapter came out, people were comparing it to Elvis's pose, so pretty cool looking Josuke, and uh, it's weird that Josuke's on the cover and he's not in the chapter at all, like, we literally don't see Josuke once in the entire chapter, so to get on to the first page of it, finally, we pick up right where we left off with Ojiro attacking uh, Jobin and Tsurugi inside the Higashikata home, and in the beginning part of this chapter, I realized that Fun 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 has, like, a glaring flaw to it, or at least it's maybe, like, I I guess you might be able to consider it a plot hole because there's a way that Ojiro could use fun 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 that he doesn't that would make his stand just like just just really broken. So what I mean by that is that we see that Tsurugi is being controlled by one of his limbs. His left arm is being controlled 
I mean, his left hand, but that's just kind of like your whole uh, left arm. And he's recording, he, he was recording footage of the Rokakaka and Joe been talking about them. And then Ojiro is on the roof above them, sending the information to his girlfriend. And in the last chapter, um, the last chapter of you, I was kind of like going off about like, you know, I don't really know what these guys want, but people were correcting me and saying like, oh, X-Words, don't you remember? Like, at it, I think it was this last chapter, two chapters ago is when Ojiro's girlfriend sort of wants the fruit more than Ojiro does, and Ojiro's girlfriend wants the land that the Higashikata, you know, family is on, which seems like kind of unrealistic, because the family's been there for, like, hundreds of years, the mansion was built there, it just seems unrealistic to be like, I'm gonna take their land, but... Both these characters um, are pretty irrelevant by the end of this chapter, and again, we'll get into it at the end, I think these two were, like, well-written villains, sort of, like... I'm, they're like less than minor villains almost because Ojiro's already been a minor villain and this lady just sort of came out here you know with her own ambitions completely separate from what we know as like are kind of the villains like the rock animals and the doctors and everything but um yeah I guess you could, like you might be able to consider these guys filler but they were important for Jobin's development or what Araki wanted to show us uh more into Jobin's character but again, we'll get onto that a little bit later. So getting into what I mentioned a few minutes ago, like a minute ago, about like the glaring flaw with fun, 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 is that you see Surugi is being controlled in his left arm, and he starts scratching it, and he starts bleeding. And what I, at first what I thought this was, I thought Ojiro was using Surugi's left arm to scratch his right arm to injure it, but it wasn't. It was just Surugi scratching the mark off, trying to like get it off. And he's like, oh my god, it won't come off. And I thought to myself, it's like, okay, so the way the fun, fun, fun works, or at least in the beginning, was that if you injure a limb, or if, if you bleed it all, essentially, like if you get pricked by something, Ojiro now has control over that limb. And we saw in the, the, the first fun, fun, fun arc that at first, Josuke, you know, I think it started with one of his hands, and then he like stepped in a slipper that had uh, whatever, pins in it, and then his foot got control. But it's like, realistically, if Ojiro can take control of just one of your limbs, he's already won. Because the way it works, it also says that if you control all four limbs, you're pretty much like a puppeteer. You have control over the entire body. So, I don't see any reason why Ojiro couldn't do this. He gets control of Surugi's left arm. He, ha he has control over the left arm. Take something sharp, stab, stab, stab. You have control over the whole body. Like, like easy as that. But it's like Ojiro has never used fun, fun, fun in that way. So it's like, maybe that's a limitation. Maybe he can't pierce another limb with a limb he already controls. But like, that seems so easy. So just like, like really just like, Oh, I have control over this limb. Make a wound, and then make a wound on the legs, and then you have full control of the whole body. But I guess Ojiro just never thought to do that, so instead he was like, I'll put, you know, I'll, I'll put uh, razor blades in the doorways on the door handles, and then in the slippers and everything, when realistically... He could just stab all the limbs with the one limb he controls. And honestly, we shouldn't even go by the assumption in current day Ojiro that he needs to even injure you to uh, attach fun, fun, fun to your body. Because we see a few pages after that when he tries to bring Surugi up onto the roof to grab the phone from him, that Jobin reaches out to sort of protect Surugi. He's like, no, come back down. And then Ojiro just touches Jobin's hands and then Fun Fun attaches to them. It's, it's, it's kind of... It's hard to interpret because it looks like Ojiro just pokes them and on one of the hands you see like a little like thing of blood coming down so it's like maybe Ojiro poked Jobin's hands and made two injuries on him but honestly it looks like he just touched him and then Fun Fun was attached and that's sort of what he did with Surugi too because um, I was big on it last chapter that like Surugi never got injured. Surugi just met Ojiro and they didn't they never really they I don't even think they came into contact. I think um, Ojiro just like touched his hand but it's like yeah, I don't remember Surugi ever getting his left hand uh, pierced or anything. I could just be really forgetful from last month, but um, what we saw with Jobin again in this chapter, it looks like Ojiro doesn't need to injure you anymore. He just kind of needs to touch you to take control of it. And, you know, speaking of Ojiro, he's kind of a badass this chapter, the way that he's, like, just completely destroying Surugi and Jobin in this in this first half of it with fun, fun, fun. It's like, with his, like, change in personality, he's really kind of mastered his stand. Maybe it's, like, uh, it, it changed a little bit from what we can see. Or maybe Iraqi just didn't really remember the way it worked originally and wanted to change it up. Or he just wanted to change it up a little bit for the sake of the chapter. Um, but yeah, Ojiro really just like destroys these guys. And within the first like 15 pages, he he is out of there. And uh, he, he pretty much won the fight, but um, not for long. Did not win the fight for long. But before we get into like the, the middle of the chapter, I wanted to talk about this. This I love when this happens when... Um, so Ojiro's got... Jo oh, okay. Ojiro, these fucking names. Ojiro's got Surugi and Jobin sort of like at gunpoint, essentially. Like, he has control over both of them, and he's like, before I go, let me see your stand, which is like, 
occasionally this happens in JoJo and it's really smart when the person does do it because it's like, I mean, that's what I would do if I like had an advantage position against another stand user and I didn't know what their stand was, I'd say, bring it out. Let me see what this thing looks like. Uh, it reminds me again, because of the part five anime airing right now, when Polnareff came back and when he was looking at uh, Diavolo, or when he was looking at Bruno, he was like, show me your guys' stands. Like, just, just show me your stands so I can see what they look like. Maybe by an appearance, I could determine their range. So, Polnareff did it. He was a really smart and experienced stand user. And Ojiro is using the same technique, which is pretty cool. Um, so, Ojiro... Oh, God. This, this is like some body horror in this chapter. Like, the way that... Uh, so, when Strugi gets busted out the window, it's like shattered glass. And then Hojiro makes Jobin, who he has control of close the window with him and Surugi inside it and they just get absolutely destroyed. But during this chapter, we're kind of getting, like us the readers are being affected by Paper Moon Cane. Like Araki uses standability on us almost. And I also like when Ojiro says, bring out the stands, Surugi brings out Paper Moon Cane and he's like, Sir, you put that thing away. I don't need to see that thing. But when we saw Speed Cane, I really love Speed Cane's design. The thing is like, it looks horror inspired, but it, it's just, it looks like you just took a bunch of parts and threw them together. It's really mechanical, but it's also sort of organic. Its ears look like tree branches. And uh, yeah, it just looks like a pissed off scary stand, similar to King Crimson, the way it's like always yelling. But Speed Cane, I've always liked its design and I always thought it was a really cool stand, even before what we see it do in this chapter. And I remember way back, maybe like, um, I think this was during the Beetle Tendon, arc when Jobin and Josuke fought with Beatles, uh, there was a cover page that said like, something about Speed Cane's true ability has not been revealed, or Jobin doesn't even know the capabilities of the stand's true ability or something like that. And forever now, for the past like four years since Jojolian has been going on, people always say things to the like of Speed Cane's hidden ability. Like maybe Speed Cane one day will reveal its secret ability. And like, I never, th I thought Speed Cane was already, already pretty strong the way it was. And I don't think it ever had People like were predicting it would get some like crazy power up. Like it can just like throw fireballs out of its hands because it already controls heat. But in this chapter, I think we get like the rest of Speedkin's ability explained because we see it do something new in this chapter, which is really powerful and it, it makes the stand have like two forms almost. But yeah, I think this chapter sort of is gonna clear up what everyone was wondering about Speedkin's hidden ability. And uh, yeah. Let's stop talking about that because I think it's like even after this chapter, it's it's already really strong the way it's being used. And, uh, you know, speaking, we're going to get into that really soon right now. So when Ojiro, before he leaves the house, uh, he notices Jobin lying on the ground, like dead, what he thinks, although he's being affected by Paper Moon Kane, which is revealed later in the chapter, which is really smart on Surugi's part. And I love when we see Surugi and Jobin working together. We originally saw them tag team in the Ozone Baby fight when... Surugi used Paper Moon King on everyone to fool them into thinking the real branch was the was a fake branch. And then uh, Jobin obviously lit the orchard on fire. And we see them team up again where Surugi used Paper Moon King on Ojiro to make him think that their wounds were like way more extreme than what they were. And again, this gets into the point where like Surugi's stand is so powerful, way more powerful than like really any other stand we've seen in part eight yet, just just based on it fundamentally. So do you guys remember when Surugi was first introduced and there was that weird arc of Jobin and Yasuo, or not Jobin, Josuke and Yasuo running around Morio and everyone's face looked the same. And like the way Paper Moon King was first introduced, it's like, I can make everyone's face look like my own, which would be Surugi. So everyone looked like Surugi. But as the part has gone on, like I said this before in another chapter review, but, uh, Srugi's stand has essentially just turned into Aizen's uh, Zanpak Toe from Bleach to the point, uh, what was the thing's name, dude? I haven't read Bleach in like a decade. Well, actually, it hasn't been a decade. It's been like three years since it finished. But uh, God, what was, <sighs> let me know in the comments if you know, what was the name of Aizen's Zanpak Toe and Bleach? If you haven't read Bleach, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But essentially, Aizen's ability was that he was just able to mess with your perception. Like he could make a fly appear as like a dragon destroying the city. And I don't see any reason why Surugi also couldn't have that ability. He made he made Jobin look like a bus, or he made a bus look like Jobin. And it's just, now he can just, he can just take control of your vision and make you see really whatever he wants you to see. So Surugi's stand is just like, and I wouldn't say this is him evolving in any way or is standing in a power up. This just seems like Araki changing its definition over time, but it, it's it's extremely powerful. So when Ojiro sees them on the ground, bloodier than they should be, he sees money hanging out of Jobin's wallet. And at first I was like, dude, Ojiro really is trash. Like, you know, anytime you want to make a character in like any sort of fiction seem like really evil, you pretty much make them do really bad things to children. And when I saw Ojiro like taking 
control of Surugi's hand and throwing a razor blade into his face, it's like, okay, kind of fuck Ojiro. Surugi's one of my favorite characters in all of Part 8, and it's like, like, you really gotta be a piece of shit to, uh, you know, just do that to a child. And they keep saying that as well in the last chapter. There was that little speech bubble next to Ojiro that said 100% trash. And then in this chapter, um, after the fight concludes, like in a few pages right here, Jobin's like, I want to know what a piece of trash like that. Like, why did he come out of the, you know, the sewers or something like to come mess with us? Like, that is the real danger here. Why I'm curious. Um, but again, that maybe alludes to the Ojiro and his girlfriend are working with a motive that hasn't really yet be revealed and maybe they'll be connected to bigger parties right now like maybe the head doctor or something but uh after the end of this chapter i think jobin was just kind of overthinking it and uh yeah i think they're pretty much going to be gone because i think these two were just used for jobin's development and to reinforce what type of a character he is in the part so Ojiro sees the money sticking out of Jobin's wallet. He takes it and he goes on his way. And we see more of Ojiro's attitude when he's in a taxi. He's just really arrogant, kind of a piece of shit, pretty much 100% trash. And then we get into Speed Cane's full ability revealed, I want to say, like its true capabilities and what it can do. So before, Speed Cane, everyone thought it was extremely weak because the stand couldn't create fire. It couldn't, you know, it, it was, it was really different from a lot of other heat abilities you'd see in any other sort of anime or manga. Like he can't summon fireballs. He can't like just burn you. What he can do is that he can store up temperature in a certain place and just make heat stay there and gradually get hotter. So the way we've seen this used before was in the beetle arc when he used it on the beetles. I think it was like to melt the forceps I don't know. I'm not an anatomy expert on beetles. I can't remember like the big claws that the beetles have in the front, I guess their mouth. Jobin used it to melt those off of Josuke's beetle, I think it was. And then the next time we saw it was during the Blue Hawaii arc, I want to say, when Jobin came up behind Yasuo. And I always forget that that happens. Jobin like actually tried to kill Yasuo at one point. Um, which makes me think like, and, jo and Josuke knows that Jobin did that. So I think the next time Josuke and Jobin meet face to face, I feel like there should be some sort of confrontation about that. Like, hey, Jobin, 30 chapters ago, you tried to kill my girlfriend. Like, fuck you, dude. But I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's forgotten between the characters. But before when he tried to do that to Yasuo, it like just melted her face a little bit. And I don't know, it hurt her brain and she passed out. And for the longest time, everyone thought that Speed King's range was really short. So the stand only worked. I think it even stated its range was like a few inches or something. Like when we saw it used on Yasuo, he was right next to Yasuo. When we saw it used on the Beetle, it was right next to it. But it turns out that Speed King is, Speed King is actually able to change its stand type in a way to an automatic long range type stand. And he's able to attach Speed King onto objects, which makes it infinitely more powerful. So to elaborate on that, when Ojiro takes the cash out, it's really important to pay attention to like the small details here. So he was holding the cash in the taxi and then he says like, oh, my fingers are really hot. And he like licks his fingers, I guess, to sort of cool him down. And then he says like, what is burning me up? And he reaches into his pocket and then his whole tongue starts to melt and it goes up his face and Ojiro just essentially drops dead because he's getting the same sort of effect that was on Yasuo when it melted up her face. And obviously, you know, if you have internal damage under your brain or something, that's really bad and you'll probably die. And that's essentially what happened to Ojiro here. So I really love the small details because it's like, so Jobin, very smart of him. He knew that Ojiro was trash and he knew that Ojiro, oh, excuse me. He knew that Ojiro would probably take the money if he saw it standing out, like hanging out of his pocket. So Jobin, before he like played dead on the ground, I guess what he was doing, he attached Speed Cane onto the cash. Ojiro grabs the cash. He's touching it. Then, so then Speed Cane is able to transfer to his fingertips. He licks his fingertips. Speed Cane's ability transfers to his tongue. And then he has the pocket, he has the money in his like chest pocket. And obviously Speed Cane is all also attached to the cash and it's burning up his chest. So then like Ojiro by his, by his own accord has spread Speed Kin's ability all over his body and he's just getting completely destroyed by it right now. And this is something that Jobin is doing like a mile away from him, even more than a mile away from him. And uh, yeah, that's really, that's really strong. So like if you have a personal belonging of someone like a cell phone that we'll see later in the chapter, if you, so when, if Jobin Based on this ability that Speed King has now, if he can touch any personal item someone has, he's won. He's, he's, he's essentially already beat them because he can attack them from an extremely long range like we're seeing with Ojiro now. And there's really no way to defend against that because first of all, you don't really know what's happening and it's all happening under your skin. 
So speed cane, really powerful. And just in general, I think this is a great addition to speed cane's ability, and it's nothing too out of the ordinary for Jojolian. Obviously, Jojolian like has a reverse power creep where all the stands are much weaker than in previous parts. So when people were thinking of like outlandish, you know, ability that speed cane would have, maybe it could like, you know speed up the you know uh, process of which molecules move which makes them really hot and he could affect things on a global scale something as powerful as like heavy weather maybe like rain hellfire down it's like that would just seem way too out of the ordinary in jojolian and just be like way more powerful than anything else that we've seen in the part so far so i think this very subtle addition to its ability being able to affect people at long ranges like makes it perfectly balanced in the world of jojolian before i thought it was a little too weak because it was just it took a little bit time to activate and you needed to be really close to your target, but this makes it just like very balanced. So Speed Cane, um, after this chapter, I like it even more. And it's it's always been one of my favorite stands in Jojolian, but uh, I always love when like some of my favorite stands are seen in different ways, get new abilities or something like that. And I like how it's not just like a new ability out of the blue, like I mentioned earlier, which kind of happened with Sarugi, how it's like my stand can just kind of like do whatever I want now and same with Paisley Park. I like how it was foreshadowed that Speed Cane had something we didn't see yet and now this is the payoff for that foreshadowing maybe like 50 chapters ago. But now we get into the final act of the chapter where we sort of have all the twists revealed to us. So you see that, that now it's revealed that Surugi has been using Paper Moon Kane to trick Ojiro to see to seem that they were more damaged than they were. And also Jobin. Jobin is just like a 200 IQ in this chapter right now because he doesn't tell Surugi that he killed Ojiro. Although like he knows in his head he killed Ojiro, but maybe he wants to make himself look a little bit more innocent in the eyes of Surugi. And he says... Uh, uh, okay, so he has the flower plant, and then he says out loud, he says, Ojiro, I think he says something like, Ojiro set it on a, uh, by the by a road, either at a bus stop or just on the side of the road somewhere. And at first I was like, well, how would, how would, uh, how would Jobin know that? But then it's like, wait, okay, so he knows he left on foot, and Ojiro took Jobin's money, and Jobin has the wallet, the empty wallet in his hand, so it's like also intentional, obviously intentional because he attached speed cane to the money. And he knows that Ojiro would stop to get a taxi or stop to get a bus not too far outside of the Agashigata property. So he's like, well, I know that he's dead. I'm not going to tell Surugi that, but I know he's dead because he took the money pretty much like insta-kill because it had speed cane attached to it. And uh, so yeah, all I have to go now is look at, at a bus stop or a taxi because in order to get in the bus stop or the taxi, he would have needed to touch the money. So then he would have touched the money, started getting affected, and then he would have died right there on the side of the road. So very smart on Jobin's end. And then we get into like some other trickery that he did off screen, I guess. And we see Ojiro's girlfriend who is coming home and she has a little nickname for him. She's just like, oh, Sean, where are you? And we see the same pool where we first saw Ojiro, their property sort of on the top floor of like an apartment building or something. And Ojiro's phone is next to the pool. And like by the end of this chapter, I'll explain more, but this, this part just had me like a little bit confused. And Ojiro, I forget this lady's name. She's kind of irrelevant. Just, I guess I'll just refer to her as Ojiro's girlfriend. So Ojiro's girlfriend is with her daughter and uh, they're looking for Ojiro and they see Ojiro's phone by the poolside. And it, it's, uh, I can't remember if it rained, but I know Jobin was on the other side. So she picked up the phone and it was Jobin talking to her. And uh, he was just like, it reminded me so much. I know I always bring up Breaking Bad analogies when it comes to Jojo, but this scene right here reminded me of Breaking Bad season five. Uh, if you haven't watched Breaking about it don't worry about it if, if you ever watch it you probably won't remember this spoiler whatsoever um but the main character walter white is talking on the phone with another character lydia and he poisoned her and she's like dying while he's talking to her and he's like oh you're not feeling too well yeah that's the rice and i gave you you'll be dead in a few seconds so uh you know Great knowing you. And this is what it reminds me of right here, because Jobin attached Speed Cane also to Ojiro's phone. Or somehow Ojiro, when he was touching the money, he touched his phone at some point and then it all transferred to it. So Jobin knows that Speed Cane is attached to his phone, or to Ojiro's phone, I know it's kind of confusing. We'll have visual aids up over here so you guys can follow along. And uh, she's on the phone and he's like, hey, are you Ojiro's girlfriend? Are you the person that was getting the footage of the Rokakaka and all the evil shit I was doing? He goes, well, yeah, you're dead. I'm going to kill you right now while he's on the phone with her. And he's like, you're, and he also said some like really cool shit. He was like, um, 
He was like, you're not a stand user, are you? He was like, well, if you were a stand user, I was gonna have to kill your entire family because he has his daughter. And I guess, you know, it's really established in the Steel Ball Run universe that stands transfer through your lineage. They, you know, they're always passed down, which wasn't always the case in the alternate, or in the, the original universe. Um, obviously, Jolene was the son of Jotaro, or the, the son. Jolene was the daughter of Jotaro and she wasn't a natural born stand user. She had to get her stand from the stand arrow. But when it comes to the alternate universe, it seems like it, you have like a 90 percent chance to get a stand when you're a relative of a stand user, as seen with the Higashikata family, as they're, they're literally all stand users, not a single exception. Um, so he was like, well, that's a good thing you're not a stand user, because if you were, I was going to murder your daughter. And it's like, damn. And that's sort of where it kicked in, where like, this whole arc was, I feel like it was to establish Jobin's just like ruthless mentality he has, and maybe how he could potentially fulfill a more villainous role later in the part. Um, although, I think Jobin personality-wise and stand-wise could fulfill the role of a quote-unquote main villain, but I just, I don't see the motivation. I don't think Jobin has a strong enough motivation to justify him being empathetic enough to, you know, grasp readers' attention as a main villain. Uh, that's just how I see him at this point in time. But yeah, he murders Ojiro's girlfriend right in front of her daughter. And there's this weird couple panels right here. And I don't know what Araki was trying to say here. I think he was trying to give a diss to millennials always being on their phone or something. Because Ojiro's daughter's on her phone. She has her earbuds in. And her mother dies, falls in the pool. And she just like looks up. And then, <laughs> and then looks back down on her phone like she's texting or something. It's like, dude, Araki really hates... Yeah. Rocky hates all the Zoomers always being on their phones. I don't know what he was trying to say here. I feel like that was a diss to us. Um, but yeah, and and right here is where I was confused. Ojiro is at their house in the bottom of the pool. It's like, how did Ojiro get there? So the way I see this is that I think Jobin had to go go retrieve the pot plant that had the Rokakaka in it, and then he carried <laughs> Ojiro's dead body back to his apartment, threw him in the pool, and then set the phone by the poolside and then left. I feel like that is the only way that Ojiro could have been back in his apartment in the pool, unless maybe he didn't die on the side of the road and he stumbled his way to the apartment somehow and then he died. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure Jobin carried the dead body or caught a car or something and took the dead body all the way back to the apartment. But that's just weird stuff that happened off screen. And uh, yeah, the two lovers, they die in the pool together and their blood sort of goes together. Kind of nasty. And then we have the final page of the chapter. Where does Jobin confirmed he got the Rokakaka back from the, uh, like the growing Rokakaka back from the street and he's walking back to the Gashigata family. And it says there was no hesitation. Sort of again to establish the ruthlessness and just, uh, you know, sheer violence Jobin portrayed in this chapter. So then we get on to the question, what was the point of Ojiro? Oh, and also there's a little bit, there's a little text box at the bottom that says three days and 19 minutes uh, until the Rokakaka harvest. So we're getting close to the climax, guys. I can't wait to see this thing harvested and what is going to happen when it is harvested. And all the people coming out of the woodwork, like, I want the fruit, I want the fruit, I want the fruit, and then everything's going to come together and who knows what the hell is going to happen then. But in the meantime, that's the question. Why was Ojiro reintroduced only to die off two chapters later? And I gave my like short opinions of this chapter on Twitter and someone made a really good point. I'll put the original tweet down below in the in the description, but it was, it was a really good tweet that said like, he said, I think Araki introduced Ojiro again so he could quickly display this part of Jobin's personality without having to waste time by introducing like a brand new stand and have us understand a new concept and inter just introduce a new stand to the readers, which I thought was like very smart on Araki's part because it's like, like, think about it. Every time, you know, a new stand is introduced, it's at least like three or four chapters. In this one, we were able to bring back a previous villain. And if you notice in these two chapters, Never once was their time spent explaining fun, fun, fun. Never. Because we already know what fun, fun, fun does. So Araki doesn't need to waste time. He doesn't need to drag this arc out to be three or four chapters to explain to us his stand ability, ex you know, give exposition and give context to a brand new character. But so it seems like how I interpret this, like I said earlier, I think the point of these two chapters were to set Jobin up to fulfill a more villainous role maybe later in the part and to show that he is like a ruthless killer in a sense. He cares about Tsurugi, but um, at the same time, he will kill this woman who's not even a stand user and he'll kill Ojiro. Although, you know, it was kind of rightfully so. They were trying to ruin him. They were trying to bring him down, although he is kind of doing like malicious stuff. Um, but whatever. Jobin definitely was just expressing, you know, how violent he can be. 
And I thought it was really smart for Iraqi to be able to show us the side of jo Jobin's personality, or better establish the side of his personality with wasting as little time as possible. So I imagine like maybe Iraqi's writing process was like, you know, okay, maybe in 10 or so chapters from now, I want Jobin to be like a real antagonist role and make him seem very evil. But you know, Jobin hasn't been in the story in a long time and he hasn't really done anything too evil in a while. Well, how about I spend one or two chapters setting up and showing Jobin killing two people and just being very, very violent about it and being very ruthless. So how would I go about doing that with wasting as little time as possible? Oh, a light bulb pops in the head. Ojiro's still kicking around. How about we bring in a character that's already been in the series before and we already know what his stand does so we can just quickly express this part of Jobin's personality in just two chapters. I guess that's just sort of the way I interpreted it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Let me know what you guys thought about, you know, what was the point of Ojiro's return and what Araki was trying to accomplish here with bringing Ojiro back and killing him off in just two chapters chapters now, but I think I think that pretty much nails it. I think we were just trying to develop Jobin's character a little bit more and establish him as more of a, a villainous role. Although it's it's kind of weird when Iraqi does that because like in these chapters, me personally, you know, when you see two characters going at each other, you need to view at least one of them from a uh, protagonist point of view. And although Araki has done it before where he has two villains fight, you're always kind of rooting for one. If you guys remember in the, I'm sure you guys are familiar because part five is airing right now. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the uh, Risotto versus Dopio fight. And that was a fight where two villains are duking it out. But it's like, you know, although they're two evil people, you're, you're kind of rooting for one or the other. And in that arc, I felt like uh, Dopio sort of took on the role of a protagonist there. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Maybe Iraqi wants to show Jobin as a villain, but at the same time, he's kind of making him come off as a protagonist, fulfilling a protagonist role, uh, fighting against a villain that we've already seen our protagonist fight against. But depending on how you interpret it, you know, it definitely works to set Jobin up with more villain. But uh, again, it, it can also make you sort of view him as a protagonist fighting against other villains we saw. Um, but I think that's going to be all my opinions on Jojolian chapter 88. And next month, we have chapter 89, which is a chapter that people have been like building up because the head doctor is 89 years old. And since we're finished with this Ojiro arc, we better, we better see the head doctor in chapter 89, Araki. He better have a stand reveal. We better see an identity. This better be like, this next chapter better be all about the head doctor because this is 89. Um, but for now, those are my opinions and that's everything I have to say about Jojolian chapter 88. So thank you guys so much for watching and, uh, Hopefully you guys enjoy the new backdrop. Like I said, if you guys stay till the end of the video, I'll give you guys a quick little tour. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and look at the shelf and then I'll let you guys get out of here. So here's a quick tour of the new space. So you have the wall over here. Obviously you have that 100K plaque that we mentioned in the beginning. Kingdom key, some art that's been drawn for me by my girlfriend throughout the years. Some very nice stuff. And then we have the, uh, the Jojo Kingdom Hearts shelves. You have the Jojoniums. Uh, the first volume of parts one through four, you have Jojo Agogo, which is one of my favorites. If you guys have never seen Jojo Agogo, look at, look at Trisha's face right here. You can spin this. There he is. It's a Rocky. And you can spin this and it goes through like a bunch of different faces from Jojo. This is just a Rocky sense of humor, man. <laughs> well, let's go through all of it to get it back to, uh, Get it back to Iraqi. There he is, Iraqi. So the shelf is Jojo Agogo, Jojo 6251, which was, uh, well, I think, the first official art book released. Come on, focus camera. There we go. Kingdom Hearts 3 Deluxe Edition with the art book. Ooh, you have these nice uh, figures of Killer Queen and uh, Crazy Diamond that one of my fans got me and one of my friends. So thank you very much, Moogle, if you're watching. Shout outs. She got me those, she sent those to me in the mail. And then we have Jojo Veller at the bottom, the big boy. The big Jojo Veller, which I probably sh should put higher up. Ah. And then you have the microphone right there. And uh, yeah, that's sort of how I, how I do these. Um, I told you guys my keyboard was on a, a cat tree <laughs> where I could click it. And then I have the chapter over here on the left monitor and then some notes up on uh, the right. And that's what the setup's looking for uh, for the foreseeable future for JoJo Lane Reviews. So thank you guys so much for watching. Like the video if you enjoyed, subscribe for more. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Peace.